Hello everybody, Scott Golden here with the Raw Report for the 26th of uh, October uh, 2020 and um, man, this show keeps getting worse and it's at a point, I honestly believe that by playoff season for the NFL, there'll be around 1.3 million viewers, if that, if that. Um, this is just, it's its so bad, and they have so much talent, and it, there's no reason for it to be this bad. Anyway, Drew McIntyre enters to start the show. He's got no excuses over losing, but he promises he'll be WWF champion or WWE champion again, obviously. Prides himself on getting up even stronger after getting knocked down. He says people think he should be more upset, as well he should. If this is real, or even remotely an athletic contest, the champion makes more money, yes, he should be more upset. Um, so anyway, uh, he says... If you knew what was on his mind, you'd be afraid. Isn't the idea of a promo to, I don't know, tell people what's on your mind? This is just, these lines are so nonsensical. Nonsensical. They're not necessary. And they make the, in this case, McIntyre, look like a completely inept speaker. If he can't express what's on his mind, why should we listen to him speak at all? Anyway, Miz and Morrison come out. Miz uh, wants McIntyre to take a bow. Uh, McIntyre warns them not to get too close. So if you're really mad at people, aren't you going to, like, run after them and beat them up? Aren't you going to only give, like, one warning, maybe two? And anyway, um, McIntyre, in, Miz runs down everybody McIntyre beats up. Um, he says this is not as impressive as being a two-time Mr. Money in the Bank, except Miz was relevant how long ago? His his main event WrestleMania match was what WrestleMania twenty seven, isn't that like a decade ago? I did. Why are you trying to push a guy who is relevant a decade ago? I I don't I I don't understand. Um. So anyway, um, Miz said McIntyre didn't have to worry about facing Orton again. He would be the champion. And. And basically, he brags about that moment. He goes, this goes on. Um, McIntyre finally headbutts him after he rambles on for minutes to fill time on a TV show that, honestly, I'm not even a football fan, but football has to be more entertaining than this. Um, Morrison begins using a, a Scottish accent, so McIntyre suplexes him twice. McIntyre is about to do worse. Miz saves Morrison. And Miz and Morrison run away. McIntyre promises to get even. Calls them idiots and says they're in for a long night. Uh, Tom Phillips tells us that uh, Survivor Series is the one night a year that Ron Smackdown wrestlers face off against each other. Except when they do it at other times during the year. Um, McIntyre faces Miz tonight. Oh, joy. And AJ Styles enters with uh, Jordan Amogdalin. Um He's not named by the announcers. So there's a big tall guy who happens to be a bodyguard for AJ Styles who doesn't deserve a name. Um, his name didn't even appear on a big screen this week. So we're just supposed to not care about his name. Anyway, Styles said that we mu he must have missed him on Raw. He didn't think he should have to qualify for a Survivor Series team, which is what they're doing, by the way. So, year after year, they do these Survivor Series team matches. Now, being that Survivor Series is almost 35 years old, I think this will be the 33rd one or something like that. Back in the day, they used to have 4-on-4 four four or 5-on-5 five five, uh, matches, and also 5-on-5 five five tag teams, so larger matches. Back in the day, those characters were over, so people cared about seeing them go against each other. I'm going to ask an honest question. For a casual viewer, which should be what they're trying to attract because, well, you want more viewers, not less, and the people that are already into your product are going to watch no matter what you put on, 
Explain to me why people are going to care about Survivor Series when it's people against people and it doesn't really matter. Even if you make the stakes, the winner um, gets bragging rights. Why would anybody care about SmackDown versus Raw? Matter of fact, why would anybody care about two brands against each other in the same umbrella of a company? I, I really want somebody to explain this when the thought is... That if you have fans, they should want to watch all of your programming. In which case, the idea of seeing brands against each other is relatively irrelevant, especially when you mix them throughout the year. I really want a logical explanation. Except the writing team and those who approve what goes on television couldn't give one if their lives depended on it. Now, uh, Team Raw qualifying match AJ Styles with his bodyguard defeats Jeff Hardy. Match itself is fine. However, two guys over 40 in a qualifying match for a pay-per-view or network purview that no one cares about, hardly what should open a show of this nature. But anyhow, Hardy tries to dive to the outside, but he's caught by the bodyguard, who holds him, and they go to break about less than a minute into the match. Uh, they didn't acknowledge what the bodyguard did with Jeff Hardy upon his return. Styles is in control after the break. Hardy makes a comeback, gets a few near falls. Styles hits him with a fireman's carry neckbreaker. Hardy fights back. Styles pulls him off the top rope. Hits him with a spinning power bomb. Uh, they counter finishers. Hardy uses a face buster. Hardy goes to the top, but looks at the bodyguard. As if to say, should I jump on you? Uh, and then Styles knocks him down again. Styles clotheslines him, hits the phenomenal forearm, wins. Styles qualifies for Team Raw. So, in theory, that's a heel qualifying for Team Raw. Wait, it gets better. So, uh, Elias comes in, smashes the guitar across Hardy's back from a storyline from several months ago that people didn't care about when it happened. So they care about it now after several months away. I don't quite understand why. Uh, Sarah interviews our truth Truth says he's scouting Drew Gulak, Akira Tozawa, and Lucha House Party tonight. Uh, he said, she says that must be dangerous. He says, uh, he eats and sleeps dangerously. So does that mean he sleeps upside down and eats only chocolate? How does one eat and sleep dangerously? Um, so anyway, uh, Lucha House Party defeats Akira Tozawa and Drew Gulak in two minutes, or just a little bit over. So this is a complete throw a throwaway match. Truth enters uh, to his music during the match. Uh, Tozawa creeps behind him, gets a schoolboy... And gets a, gets a near fall. Truth fights off Tozawa and gets in the ring. Others try pinning Truth. Lindsay Dorado hits a cross body. Truth moves. Dorado hits Gulak with the move and wins the tag match. Everyone tries going after Truth. And he keeps kicking out and running away. This is a waste of time. Nothing against our truth. Ron Killings is a talented individual. He's comedically funny. His timing is good. He's been around for, I don't know, 20, 25 years in terms of, I think he came in in 99. So, you know, 20 plus years on and off. Great guy. Awesome. But why, why do we care about this throwaway title that he's held, announcer says, 42 times? Just why? Um, and they've ruined another one of my favorite characters, in this case, Bray Wyatt. So they have a tea party. Bray is dressed like a Mad Hatter. Alexa Bliss shows up. I like her in this new, darker role. She says she showed up with a secret uh, tea that has a secret ingredient in it. She reveals later that the secret ingredient is arsenic, and she gives it to one of the puppets. So, in theory, this program is marketed towards children, 
We've just taught children how to murder people. Because if children Google arsenic, they'll learn it's a, you know, um, potential murder. Anyway, Rabbit drinks it. And Bray Wyatt says, everybody's mad. Um, and it, Alexa Bliss in normal bubbly Alexa wonders how Wyatt knows she's mad. Wyatt says she has to be mad to be here. Her eyes turn red and says, let him in. Her eyes return to normal. They do a camera cut. She plugs a moment of bliss. This is with Randy Orton. Wyatt is... Uh, he's standing next to a picture of the shed burning down and screaming plays in the background. Rabbit wakes up, so he's like been risen from the dead. And he says he's going home to his wife. Uh, after saying this, Bray Wyatt manages to beat up a puppet with a weapon. Uh, he looks forward to see. He looks forward to doing this. Keith Lee tells Charlie Caruso that there's no question that Braun Strowman cheated last week. So now Keith Lee, who's a 330-pound monster, is complaining about winning and losing. Um, calls Braun Strowman basically not a man. Lee threatens to get even with Strowman. Uh, and then he's got Elias to deal with first. So, Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler approach Adam Pearce. Jax uh, said the women wouldn't be having qualifiers and offers Adam Pearce a list. And then he says he'll take this under advi advisement. Shayna Baszler offers Adam Pearce a list. He says he... We'll take this under advisement too, but neither one of them are captain. He'll make a decision later. So let's get this straight. The men's team is worthy of having qualifying matches. The women's team, at least at this point in the program, is unworthy of having qualifying matches. How come? Who made this decision? Why did they make this decision? Aren't we in the middle of a women's revolution? Um, shouldn't we at least give equality and wouldn't it give us more television programming, among other things? Anyway, we move along to Team Raw qualifying match, Keith Lee and Elias. Now, it takes Keith Lee. Remember Keith Lee, who happened to be one of the biggest people on NXT less than a year ago? Remember Keith Lee, who was involved at the last Survivor Series with Roman Reigns? Remember Keith Lee, who unified the North American and uh, NXT championships. Remember that guy? Well, anyway, he has to take 10 minutes to beat Elias here. Elias, a guy that, while having charisma, is virtually nothing in the ring. Uh, Elias tries to perform. Lee interrupts. So Lee does the heel move here. Elias goes after Lee on the outside. Lee pounces him over the announce desk. We go to a break in less than two minutes. Lee's in control. Elias hits a knee strike and a double axe handle. Lee comes back with a power slam. Uh, swinging neckbreaker by Elias that looks like he's still in wrestling school. Elias goes to the top, but distracted by Hardy's music. So let's get this straight again. Keith Lee, new guy is playing second fiddle to Jeff Hardy, who's already had a match. Old guy, um, because we want new stars to get over. So, Elias comes off the top hit and gets nailed with a spirit bomb for the pinfall. Keith Lee wins. Not a good match, but at least Keith Lee wins. Uh, and Keith Lee, if, if Keith Lee was supposed to come off like a monster, perhaps maybe like a, a little mini shadow monster um so hardy a baby face smashes a guitar over elias's back a semi baby face um tom phillips who is the most vanilla announcer ever reminds us that aj styles qualified earlier and uh backstage there's a guy about to enter the bathroom. Hurt business. Stop him. Uh, oddly enough, if you paid close enough attention, dude was going to enter the woman's bathroom. Uh, let me go back and check this. 
Um, anyway, so they said the bathroom belongs to them. So the Hurt Business runs the woman's bathroom? That's smart if they charge admission at least. Um, anyway, they intimidate the guy. Hurt Business laughs at being bullies. This is great for the Be A Star campaign. Um, Caruso approached Orton and asked if he's concerned about the Fiend showing up. Uh, and Orton didn't care about anybody, including McIntyre, and, or, Retribution, and, or, Roman Reigns, and, or, anybody. Uh, there's a video package of Hurt Business and Retribution. They announced that Bobby Lashley will face the IC champion Sami Zayn at Survivor Series. So, here's a brilliant idea. We have champions. Let's have them fight each other and have it mean nothing. Uh, that's a brilliant idea. Anyway, eight-man tag elimination match. Hurt Business defeats Retribution in 13 minutes. So, this is... <laughs> we spend months and months building up Retribution as something big. Now, they can't be what amounts to hired hands in, in the Hurt Business, even though they've been built up for months. Anyway, MVP says they'd be seeking uh, payment from WWE to take down the Hurt Business, even th or take down Retribution, even though Retribution is now contracted talent, so why is it any different than any other contracted talent? And Sheldon Benjamin said they wanted their payment in gold. So, does that mean, like, they could, you know, like, Vince could melt down his teeth and pay and pay the Hurt Business? Um, after all, I mean, you know, it'd be, it'd be a quicker way for him to step down if he had to get dental work. Um, anyway, camera person couldn't seem to keep the camera still during the entrance. Mia Yim jumps on the apron, distracts MVP, and she falls to the floor, continues to panic. Slapjack eliminates MVP at just after four minutes. Yim, Yim continues to freak out like she's uh, been exposed to some horrific thing. And they call for help. Uh, they reveal that she's faking. So the ref tosses her out after the break. Lashley eliminates Slapjack with a spear at just about nine minutes. Lashley and T-Bar uh, go to a double countout, and they brawl to the back around just before the 10-minute mark. Mace is eliminated at 11.37 after a nebulizer by Cedric Alexander. And uh, pay dirt by Benjamin. Mustafa Ali is on his own. Ali lost by DQ after hitting Alexander with a chair. Hurt business wins. Uh, Sheldon Benjamin stalked Ali, who right away, as Lashley and MVP, uh, remained to help their friends. Then we go to another segment that really is just burying people. Um, Angel Garza flirts with Mandy Rose, offers her a rose, no pun intended. She says that she's still involved with Otis. Garza insisted that he can offer the rose to Dana Brooke instead. Jackson Baszler show up. He offers them roses too. So Basically, uh, Angel Garza has been portrayed as a player who will take attention from any woman he can get, and we've established this in about two minutes. Uh, he gets brushed off by all of these people, uh, except Nia Jax eventually takes the rose. Jackson and Baszler go, go forth to discuss the Survivor Series with Rose and Brooks with Brooks, Tells them to watch their backs, and, and the titles are going to be theirs. Uh, Baszler couldn't believe that Jax took the rose from Garza. They plug Elias' Elias's album again, which is number two on the iTown soundtrack chart. Uh, anyhow, we go to the third hour. So we've watched two hours of this. 
and there's been nothing redeeming on this program so far. Uh, in just about four and a quarter minutes, Drew McIntyre defeats The Miz with John Morrison. McIntyre uh, is in control, but he's doing a lot of selling because he be- got beat up pretty bad last night. Miz uh, kicked him in the knee, hit a DDT for one count. Morrison takes a cheap shot. McIntyre comes back with a clothesline, suplexes, and a neckbreaker. Miz uh, allows Morrison to try to attack again. Uh, McIntyre kicked the briefcase out of the hands of Morrison and suplexed him. McIntyre tosses the briefcase away, which I guess is kind of like a power move. Anyhow, uh, Miz uses a small package for near fall. McIntyre comes right back with a Claymore kick, gets the win. And so (laughs) good for Drew that he's got a win back, yay. But however, we've just killed the money in the bank (laughs) because Miz managed to lose in less than five minutes after winning it under dubious distinctions, mind you. But still, anyway... Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods are in the back. They're doing impressions of Street Profits. They have Brent Solo Cups. And uh, Kingston's acting kind of drunk. Woods tells him he's going too far with the impression. Uh, And they plug that they're going to fight the Street Profits at Survivor Series. So, basically, we're doing Street Profits and New Day with no real build-up. Yeah, we're going to give it, like, I don't know, uh, just about a month, but can you really do enough in a month to make us care about one of the greatest tag teams in uh, WWE history against cheap crime time knockoffs? I don't think so. Asuka joins them and says she wants the smoke. New Day announced that Asuka was scheduled to face Sasha Banks at Survivor Series. Orton will face Roman Reigns. So again... We've got a bunch of champion versus champion matches that really have no long-term effect. Why don't they just not do Survivor Series if it's going to be a throwaway show? Why bother with this? Uh, Herd Business shows up, plugs Lashley's match against Zayn. They want to shot at New Day's tag titles sometime before the uh, Survivor Series. It would appear New Day laughs. Asuka said she would try and... F- Asuka said they would try and fail, and she starts a New Day Rocks chant. McIntyre tells Caruso that he would take whatever steps necessary to become champion again. He threatens to show up against uh, again with Randy Orton in Moment of Bliss later on. Adam Pearce and Pat Buck, remember him, who got beat up by Nia Jax several months back, uh, show up to announce the Survivor Series team for... The women, they announced Jax, Baszler, Rose, and Brooks would be four members of the teams. Jax wanted to announce the final member. Pierce said that that spot would be determined in a match between Lana, Lacey, Evans, Peyton, Royce, and Nikki Cross. Um, How come they get a match to determine the last ones, but everything else is just randomly chosen? Anyhow, probably because we want to fill time on the show. We do with the fatal four-way match between these four women. Lana defeats Lacey Evans, Peyton Royce, and Nikki Cross to qualify for the team in just just over eight minutes. Um, Royce is in control. Cross makes a comeback, and Royce gets in with a high cross body for two. Evans takes out Lana with the women's right. Royce takes out Evans with a kick. Uh, and uses uses Cross as a weapon. Evans with a gory bomb for near fall. Evans and Cross fight, and then there's a German there's a German suplex here. Lana goes at it with Royce, pins Cross to win the match. Lana is on Team Raw. It's part of Team Raw. I mean. No one cares because then she's going to end up going at it with, uh, uh, you know, all all of this all of this again. 
Jax puts her through the table again. Then we go to the waste of Matt Riddle. Matt Riddle gets defeated by Sheamus, who is now on Team Raw. Um, for, I guess, no other reason than the fact we can throw away Matt Riddle. Because, yeah, he's athletic. Yeah, he would connect with both kids and women and guys and stoners. But who cares? He's not Sheamus. Like, I don't even understand why you bring him up if you're going to throw him away like this. Anyway, uh, Phillips basically implies that the wrestlers don't particularly like Riddle, but the fans are enamored with him. I guess that's an inside comment that we should all be aware of. Sheamus goes for knee strike. Um, Riddle runs up and hits an avalanche exploder. Uh, Riddle tries the floating bro. Sheamus gets out of that. Uh, Sheamus is clubbing him with shots. Riddle counters the white noise into a sleeper. Sheamus manages to get out, misses a brogue kick. Riddle hits a German suplex for a near fall. Riddle tries to lift Sheamus, but his back gives out. Sheamus hits a brogue kick and wins. Match is fine, but there's no reason on any planet to beat Matt Riddle in this type of environment. Because we want to make new stars, but no, we really don't. Anyway, we close with an interview segment because... Well, that's what we do to gain, gain new viewers. Moment of Bliss is introduced. She brings out Randy Orton. She says she doesn't bite, she promises. And she speaks to him like he's a five-year-old child. Uh, she, Orton asks if she has any surprises for him. She makes reference to burning the house down, which is a reference to The Fiend. Um... And then Orton asks where, where the Fiend is. McIntyre enters. They brawl around. Bliss is sitting on the top turnbuckle during all this. She's laughing, so we're not supposed to take it seriously because she's not. Uh, McIntyre beats up Orton and throws the furniture around. Orton um, gets set up for a Claymore kick. Uh, lights go out. Fiend is, is... Lights come back on. Only McIntyre's in the ring. Orton's backed up the ramp. Fiend is on the ramp with Orton. Orton doesn't want to go any further. Makes his way back to the ring. Orton and McIntyre brawl around ringside again a second time. And then Orton dumps McIntyre over, on, on the announce table. McIntyre fights back. Tries to stab Orton in the eye with a pen. This is real wholesome family entertainment. McIntyre continues the attack, and they go off the air. So either way, here's our options. We get The Fiend and Orton again, which was so great the first time that no one cared. Or we get Orton and McIntyre again, which no one cared about. Or we get a, non, a non-title deal with Fiend and McIntyre, which no one's going to care about. They... <laughs> This is like, the show gets worse and worse. It's almost to the level of, like, how bad can it get? And you watch just to see how inept they are. At least that's what I'm doing most weeks with WWE programming now. One out of three shows is good usually once a week. And it changes week by week. And that's what WWE is these days. I miss the days when I cared. I care more about squash matches on, on my Superstar series than I do about at least 70% of what's on Raw and SmackDown and sometimes NXT. Anyway, we'll close with that. Uh, until next time, keep your feet on the ground, your mind in the moment.